that brings up a couple of different conversations that regardless of the drama, I think are really important and valuable to talk about, which is the nature of experiencing anti-Blackness, why we all internalize it to some extent, and how the way we talk about it makes things better or worse for Black people in general. So a couple of things I want to get across before we start, because I don't want to, I, I, y'all know my back <laughs> and my stomach are not going to hold up sitting in this chair for too long, let alone my camera battery. Um, and I actually um, am going to invite people on to have this discussion with me, even people, ideally people who have a different perspective, so we can kind of like hash that out. But I want to just get across a couple of things. One, this is going to be a black only discussion. White folks in the audience are uh, more than welcome to you know to to spectate um but i've if there's one thing that almost got me to fall off the wa wagon as it pertains to um people people's response to the shark drama which shouldn't have been about shark the 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 way that and then even now with uh you know abba is the way that white folks who are clearly not in community with black people are very, very much trying to overwhelm and inject their perspective into the conversation. So there will be no white people participating in this conversation. All right. Another thing I want to point out there is that the problem that is evident in this situation is white supremacy. Um, even as I think about the way I contribute to making things harder for some black people who haven't had the experience I've had, even as I want to hold space for Black people who exhibit anti-Blackness on whatever scale, I want people to keep in mind that anti-Blackness does not exist out of the context of white supremacy. So as, as much as I think Abba is a clown and a um, and uh, for his behavior, um, I understand that his behavior is, is driven by a white supremacist superstructure. So, so like... Um... So yeah, I mean, so my experience as a transracial adoptee, I mean, technically, so I was basically mostly raised white, right? So being raised by white people in French Canada, um, the whole relationship with my blackness growing up, I was often called by, I mean, white people see me as black automatically, obviously, because, you know, I look black, but black people would were the one who would const constantly question my blackness, my roots, my identity, because they said that I was technically white because of the way I was raised. Uh, they would call me Oreo or uh, um, sometimes house Negroes uh, and, and other stuff like that because again, being raised white, I felt like I wanted to be accepted by white people and black people too, but it was kind of different. It was like, I wanted to be perceived black, but like a good black, you know? A good black that white people approve of. And so for, I would say a long time, I was really more, um, I wouldn't say I was as bad at as Candace or whatever, but I was really, um, I don't know, I was just, I was kind of tap dancing a lot, you know, for, for, for acceptance. Uh, and I would say a lot of shit to like show that I was willing, you know, that I was a good black person, that I was like one of the good ones that um, I didn't want it to be kind of treated differently because of my skin color. I wanted to be treated white, basically. So that led to when I started to hang out more with black people that obviously created a bit of a clash because I kind of realized that there's a lot of realizations that kind of came up over time where at some point I realized that it doesn't really matter how much I try to be accepted, I will never be white, obviously. And so why am I trying so hard to be something that I'm not, to sound the way I, I feel like I have to sound in order to be accepted and why do I want to be accepted so badly and for what reason? And how do I really want to be perceived at the end of the day? Because the first time I heard the term house Negro and I researched it, that shit really pissed me off because I was like, how the fuck? Like, how dare you say that to me? Mm. Um, that really insulted me. And also kind of, yeah, I mean, I had to confront my own biases about Black people. Because, again, being raised 
when you are when you adopt it, there's so much that goes on in your mind about your identity, about you. And I really felt for the longest time that because I was adopted and so raised by white people that I was better than other black people mm. for some reason. Um, I was really deep into this whole white savior complex where I felt like I have I was saved. Obviously, I was right. I, I was born in a very poor country. So this whole I mean, so yeah, so I was really kind of deep in this whole white savior things, and I really thought that I, was, I have been saved, and therefore, being raised by white people, I was better. And right. so, around I would say around 20 years old, that's when I had like I really, really started to deconstruct my mental, like the whole my vision of the world, really, how I see myself, how I see the world, what what is black, what does it mean to be black, who am I, what is my identity, and stuff like that, so that. Because I didn't like this idea that I was somehow a house Negro. So, yeah. I, so yeah. If, if I could jump in, because the one thing that I want Black people specifically to kind of engage in is being on the receiving end of, I hate hearing myself in my own ears. How do I stop this? <laughs> <sighs> Why did you just do that on Zoom, man? Cause I, cause well, cause one, a lot of reasons, a lot of reasons, unfortunately, but it is what it is. All right, I need to turn the volume down on my broadcasting software. I need to just, I'm gonna just do this for a second. Um, so, um, cause I just wanted to ask a quick question. Uh, engage with like, I've never been on a receiving game really of being called Uncle Tom or anything like that. Like that's not an experience that I've had, and that's definitely something I've. Uh, welded against other black people when I felt like it was appropriate. Um, uh, I want to be clear, because this is part of the, the narrative of the discourse. Uh, I don't make it happen to police and blackness. I've talked about different black experiences being valid black experiences numerous times on the channel, but I haven't really engaged with, and because I, I don't have a real reference for, for those black folks who have grown outside of community and have found themselves trying to engage with community and being, you know, you know, blocked out. Um, it's very clear, even from the outside looking in, that that is a, um, that that is a, uh, like a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like you, you, you are trying to engage with the black communities. You have some anti-blackness in you that you haven't processed. Other black folks see that. We, we we got a strong radar for that shit. We we peep it and we, we, we let you know we see it. And we probably don't let you know in the easiest way to um, comprehend. And so then that creates animosity, which then increases anti-blackness. You know what I'm saying? Um, uh, yeah, go ahead and jump in while I see if I can. I mean, in my, I, I it didn't have like, because I know sometimes when you get called out, uh, the first instinct is usually to kind of like, you know, like kind of block the call out because you don't like being told that you were wrong about something or that you need to rethink this or that you need to educate yourself or blah, blah, blah. Um, but not like this, obviously, it, it didn't have the same impact. Like I was once called out for saying something dumb regarding trans people because I didn't know better. That really kind of pissed me off because I thought I was such a good ally. But for the black thing, black, having black people, because I was raised so, like I was so much surrounded by white people that when I finally, finally was able to see more black people and I would go to school and I was no longer like one of the two only black person in the school, right? Um, so, so then w when I started to engage more with black people, it's really, I, I, I kind of had this idea in my head of like what it would be like to speak to black people my age more. And I don't know, I thought I wasn't really in because my culture was different. So they would, they would, it was just weird for me because I thought I would kind of find a place where I belong, but I did not belong because I was not raised like them. Like a lot of them were like, uh, uh, second uh, year immigrants or first year immigrants from Africa back then where I, where I lived. So the, the culture was extremely different than what I thought I knew about black people, which was not that much anyway. Yeah. So I kind of, it, it was like a, um, no, I, I kind of made assumption about what it would be like and my experience ended up not being what I thought it would be. So that was really shocking to me 
to be like, wait, so I'm not black, but I don't understand why. <laughs> yeah, and, and I empathize with that because community is important and that experience is hard and there's like minimal resources or anything to like engage with that experience. From, from my perspective, um, like transracial adoption is either depicted as like this perfect, look how amazing these white people are with this little brown yeah. baby thing, yeah. or you hear like the worst possible scenario, but it's not like a conversation of, okay, my white family has not put me around a lot of black people. Thus, I am entering my first black space lacking so much cultural uh, context. And like, if there's a culture where cultural context is really important, it's probably black American culture or black diasporic culture in general. Um, so then you're just like playing double Dutch. Um, and, I mean, and we don't make it easy. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because that's the thing. That, that's another kind of like opening for me is when, you know, with like social media and everything, um, I then started to access more Black American culture because before that, my Black American culture knowledge was very limited because I grew up in French Canada, okay? So mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff about Black American culture that I didn't know shit about right. until Shout like... Shout out to Turner. So going on Facebook and kind of entering these black space, black American space, realizing that it was an even, it was a whole other world of like black people that I didn't know about, right? Because so far, most of my experience was mostly with either my two sisters, because we're all adopted in my, in my family, or outside people who are mostly from Africa. And now there's like this whole black American culture where like if you don't know X, Y, Z, if you don't know, um, you know, like, uh, you don't know this like, movie, you don't know this movie, dance, it's, it's, like, but if you don't like the boondocks or whatever, if you don't know this or that, you're not really black. And I was just like, what the fuck? <laughs> and it's intimidating. And I yeah. think, and this <laughs> and is one of the reasons why I wanted to have the conversation because the thing, <laughs> there is like this intersection with an intersection with an intersection of privilege that black folks who have came up around other black folks have compared to black folks who have came up apart from black spaces. Um, and it's like the shittiest privilege in the game. It's like the perk, it's like you got 17 perks for your character in Skyrim or some shit. It is the least valuable of those perks. But to you, it's a perk that you really might want. And it's almost impossible to get without like really putting yourself out there for some cringe, difficult, and maybe even traumatic experiences. Because um, have you had, as you've like, cause this is something I've heard. I actually, my, one of my son's uh, best friends is a transracial adoptee, right? His family, is very intentional about keeping him around black people, including his biological family. Um, so he's That's like, oh, okay, overall, um, they are, uh, sorry. They like, when he, in fact, they, you know, get really sensitive to it. Um, when, when he seems to exhibit a misunderstanding of his black identity, they're like, oh, fuck, we're doing it. Um, we're messing it up. Uh, mm -hmm. But on the flip side, I've also seen transracial children that as they start to exhibit more blackness, their bio, their adoptive family is like, oh, we didn't raise you to do all that. And duh, duh, duh. Um, is that something you've experienced or seen, if you don't mind getting into it? And then I guess I got to I gotta move on soon because I, I, I don't want to make room for other people. Yeah. OK. But I mean, so my family was I mean, my family did. You know, obviously it's an excuse, but they did the best they could with what they got. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I mean, they would try to like teach me, you know, about like great black people, you know, Nelson Mandela, uh, Malcolm X, you know, kind of like the mainstream one. Right. Um, so I wouldn't be completely ignorant. But 
at the same time, they didn't necessarily like actively, um, I would say like the way I would do it, knowing what it's like, you know, I know that if I would, I, I was to adopt a little girl like me, I would make sure that she knows about her roots, about the history of the place she was born, the languages that the, 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 the speak, because I don't mm. speak Creole, right? I don't speak Asian Creole. I was born in IT, and it's definitely something that, especially in Montreal, that has a huge Asian population, is something that I kind of get side eyes uh, for, you know, not speaking Creole. Uh, but I wasn't raised with Creole, I was raised in French. So, you know, there's a lot of like cultural things from my country that I take, that people expect me to know that I don't necessarily know. A lot of things that I had to read myself, you know, to a lot of shit that I had to educate myself on. That's something that my parents necessarily put on me in my education or like try to point me towards as I grew up. So I would say that that wasn't done, but they didn't also, they were not like kind of racist and they were like, uh, like, generalizing black people or like kind of making me feel bad for being black it was mostly i would say kind of like a mix of society and other black people that would make me feel bad about my blackness yeah and that's something um and not gonna uh, let you go thank you uh you can cue up uh brother with the white mic um thank you so much anais uh but kind of piggybacking on the last thing anais said something i want to put out there is and you know y'all me y'all know me i'll be taking the meeting path sometimes a thing that we have to engage with is this the go between between all right no nobody black gets to choose blackness and gets to choose the circumstance of their birth black culture has developed to be this nurturing and protective uh, element to the black experience in american worldwide and those black folks born apart from that, there's often going to be a draw to engage with it. But we are, we 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 will guard that shit, and we for good reason. There's very re good reasons why we do it. But on the flip side, as we see black folks trying to learn these things, engaging in good faith, unpacking internalized anti-blackness, which by the way, you don't have to be raised around white people to internalize anti-blackness. I don't care where you're from or what your experience has been, if you experience blackness under white supremacy, then you've internalized some anti-blackness that you should be in conversation with on a regular basis. Um, but so if people are doing that, we have to have better ways to pull them in. And I know we don't, right? At the same time, how do we guard against the bad faith actors? Uh, it, 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 that's kind of the, the difficult thing. Um, I can't even see when I'm okay. So Nice is still here. I, I can transfer her out. I can help okay. you out. Okay. Well, um, I'm Let me see if I can play with you. You should problem. be able to if you look at the browser window at the bottom. Okay. Uh, am I good to go? Or? You're good to go. Yeah. What is your name? Okay. I'm Kay. Kay, nice to meet you. What did you? Because I I don't remember everybody that I reached back out to, so I don't know where you stood. But I'll, I'll go ahead and speak your piece. Uh, yeah. Well, hi everyone. I'm Kay. I'm 20 years old. Um, I'm currently a college student at Drake University, and um, basically my experiences definitely as a black person relating to the whole stereotyping of moon, mulatto, mammy, etc. I've definitely experienced that at a very young age. And although I'm like still very young now, I've definitely experienced very like visceral reactions from different people, especially growing up in a PWI, like throughout all my life, mm -hmm. I attended PWI University. So it's definitely inescapable. Like you see it everywhere. You see it being like one of the few black people in my class. So yeah, like growing up as a PWI, been super duper challenging. And like throughout like elementary school, middle school, high school, like I'm just very flamboyant. I'm very energetic. I'm very like excited, happy, Bambi died. So I kind of would always be looked down upon specifically by like other black men because there's kind of like a stereotype for us to not have those emotions because we don't want to be seen as like super aggressive and loud and like those type of stereotypes. And like that's kind of also impacted the way like other people kind of do perceive me. And like, also like with also being a content creator, being a video essayist myself, I've definitely experienced that 
with other people, basically almost trying to gaslight you into trying to tell you how you perceive your blackness. You know, like you were mentioning, the internalized anti-blackness is a very real thing because I make anime content and it's a very, very prevalent thing in our community where specifically black men will literally try to gaslight you into thinking that there's no racism, there's no internalized anti-blackness. They'll comment on characters that are typically black women and say that they aren't offensive and try to gaslight other black women and then tell them that they're kind of crazy for it. And then it sparked an entire, there, there was an entire controversy and I think it really showed me specifically was with the Annie Tuber and how like she was commenting on like anti-blackness and then there was like a whole uproar. And then I kind of talked about that in a video on my channel regarding anti-blackness in anime and how white people and black men specifically can kind of feed into those racialized stereotypes and how like it can be very demeaning. It, be, it can be very, very hard to be a person, be a black person, but also feel like you're isolated by not only white people, but other black people. And yeah. like, I've definitely dealt with that throughout school. And yeah, that's, and that's something I, I probably didn't deal with it in the same way you did. Uh, I'm <laughs> ironically, I'm starting writing a video about anime for July. Um, and I've already interviewed some, some people for, uh, I'm supposed to talk to Veritas Joe at some point mm -hmm. in time. Bellamy gonna kill me because I forgot. I'm supposed to be talking to that nigga today, right now. <laughs> oh shit, anyway. Um, but so one of the things I talked about, well, I just finished writing was uh, how I hid my anime fandom way back in the 90s because like, if you think, and this is not to like, oppress the Olympics, but I'm just saying the way you feel now amplified for the 90s because there was no Twitter or Discord or, you know, Black BlurCon and other things where Black nerds and lovers of all these things could come yeah. together and, um, you know, enjoy this company and indulge in Blackness and this thing at the same time. Um, so, so yeah, I definitely get that. You bring up something important, which is the way that some folks, uh, traditionally black men, right, will dive in and out of these gaslighting discourses, um, where they where they cause harm to others, talk bad about people, uh, you know, and then make it seem like what they're saying isn't a big deal. And here's the key word for how people have been trying to come at me. It's like they're they're saying that I'm policing them because they just don't disagree because they just don't agree with how I see things. They'll say you're trying to make all black people a monolith, and it's like no, you said some fuck shit. We call that fuck shit shit where I'm from. We call it Uncle Tom shit where I'm from. Um, I, I I'm a I'm gonna save this for later, but like, what do you what do you do there being in it? You know what I'm saying? One. And then like, how has that affected your ability to, to engage um, in black spaces? Because you probably have to have your head on the swivel to figure out which one of these motherfuckers is going to be the one to gaslight and or, you know, try to uh, shade me because of the way I'm presenting. No, yeah, totally. And like, not, not to go off on like a tangent, but like bringing that specific, there's a very specific instance where I saw this and I don't know if like you or anyone is familiar with this anti-tuber, but it actually resulted in them quitting YouTube. It, it was, uh, I'm not sure if you know them, I think their name is Neuralities. And I do they, know Neuralities. She quit? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Because, because after she talked about Sister Crone from The Promised Neverland and how she's a literal mammy, like, you know, the exaggerated lips, bolting eyes, the fact that they killed her off, which, you know, that has a whole set, other set of issues with Black people in horror. And then when she talked about it, there's like several people, specifically Black men, telling her like, I'm Black, but I didn't find it offensive. Yes. Thus, <laughs> you're wrong. And it, it does. Shout out to all my white peers who didn't say shit the last couple of days, by the way. Shout out. Shout out to all my white folks, uh, other creators and my, and my allies whatnot that just messaged me and liked a couple of tweets because the thing about that is that it's difficult 
it's a high risk maneuver. This is something I've sold several white folks. It's a high risk maneuver whenever a white person tries to interject a discussion around race, because one, you know, they're eighty percent from the field at best, right? Eighty five, whatever. Two, there's a exploitative element to it, even if they mean well, because of just the nature of how the media works. And three, most important to this conversation, is there's always going to be, uh, you know, Uncle Tom types that want to defend racism's right to exist against them, against other Black people. I don't know. They just defend the right. They they. They really want, it's, it's this belief that if we don't talk about racism, if I act like this shit doesn't bother me, then it shouldn't bother anyone. And if nobody would just talk about it, then I'm not going to be reminded of how trash this is. Um, and then nobody's going to call me a, a, a sellout for not saying anything. It's a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. And I, I saw something on Twitter too, and it really resonated with me. It was saying like, even though as a black person, if I found something offensive, I would never ever tell another black person not to be offended. Mm -hmm. Because like, you know, like in a certain sense, it's just like, we're not monoliths. Like all of us collectively are gonna view things differently because we're individuals. So, you know, sometimes I think that type of mindset is dangerous because they think, oh, well, this person is like talking crap about this show or this person is talking crap about like this artist or whatever. And they're like demonizing their like entire presence when it's really not. It's just like criticizing something that they see. And if something that they see is like noticeable with a large group of people, then it should be okay for a person to call it out. Right. But, you know, regardless of how someone else feels about it. And I think like that, that, that that's like, that's just a whole nother issue. Like there's, there's so many different, nuances to talk about how like it's, it's specifically hard. blackness and anime street it's crazy <laughs> yeah. Yeah. no it's hard because you know this is something that uh beyond joy grace said in my last video when you're when you're growing up black and you have a specific experience of being black and you see how blackness is depicted and reflected at you and you don't like what you see because why would you because you know, the images, images of blackness, you know, there's always some positive stuff, but even the positive stuff will often have this film over it that, you know, doesn't quite pass the smell test. And then there's the negative stuff, which is everywhere. So at a young age, a lot of black people will try to figure out ways to separate themselves from that stereotypical identity. And I would argue anime is probably one of the first places they go. You know, being a weeb, like, I'm not black, I'm a weed. Like, I know somebody said that shit in a message board or 4chan or Discord somewhere, right? I'm, I'm a weed just like you guys. And you're quick to find out that, no, like, there's no pure, most, like, fervent racism going on in the internet right now than in anime communities. So, no, you're still black even when you're there. You can either be black and engage with the problem of how, ra uh, how racist the space is, or you can be one of the ones that defends uh, race the whole time. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So, yeah. Um, Kay, you want to get like one more thing in? I want to get on to uh, gentleman in the blue uh, headphones. Bella, if you can cue him up. No, um, for sure. I think like one other. On so I could hear you. Oh, it's so much better to talk without hearing myself. <laughs> no, for sure. There's just like, there's just like one last point I was thinking about. Um, and this was something I just saw recently on YouTube. Um, I'm, I think some of us are kind of familiar with Patient Zena. Um, she's like very, she claims to be very moderate with her opinions, but in return, that moderate is, it's just a disguise for conservatism. Mm -hmm. And when I watched a video from a cre from another black female creator that was talking about this, I feel like it was really interesting how she pointed out how the left and marginalized groups are not interchangeable. Like you can't, you can't act like just because you're a marginalized group, you're always going to be on the left. And you can't always think just because someone's a marginalized group that they're always going to be right. Mm -hmm. And that was something I noticed um, very, very specifically with how um, people were receiving her like Little Mermaid video. Like when yeah. people were talking about her Little Mermaid video yeah. and like when other creators were making like responses to it, um, they were basically claiming like, 
white liberal safe night or whatever, which like you were talking about how like, you know, it is kind of like a murky ground for someone who isn't black to comment on black issues, but also at the same time to act like you're really advocating for everyone in the community when you're only really engaging in right wing ideologies right. and count and constantly denouncing the left. Yeah. Even if you're not uplifting the right, you're still like demonizing yeah. the left and saying they're just like saying the right is having like different opinions, which yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, not true. it's it's complete gaslight behavior. Um, and I'm gonna let you go, Kate. Thank you so much for coming up. It's complete gaslight behavior for a lot of these uh we'll call them center to right wing interlocutors who you know claim indifference to the political reality or claim to um want to you know just critique the situation but when you analyze the critique the critique only lands with uh people with the, with the leftist perspective and the perspective that is most um uh, conducive to uh, black liberation and black issues. Yeah, it's a, but I'm sure I'm going to have to re-engage with that in a second. So uh, I'll leave that there. Bell, you still there? Let me see. How you doing, man? Can you uh, uh, put your name out there? And I got to make sure everybody can hear you. Yo, ladies and gentlemen. Yo, yo, yo. Mike Shack in the building. How we doing today? Doing good, man. Doing good. So what's your name? I am, um, I'm Marquise, uh, but some people around the internet call me the paradigm shift. Cool, cool. And so uh, where, where did you stand on this discussion? Um, so I know I don't have a lot of time. There's a lot of lore. I'm going to try to speed through it as fast as possible. Um, I have grown up in so many different environments around the idea and the identity of Black people. Um, so I'm going to just piece off a couple of events and see if that builds up a good case for me. I think that we are all quite aware that a lot of Black people participate in a lot of cool behavior. I'm just saying it out loud, straight and forward, for foremost. We don't have the time, and I understand what, what ends up happening here. I understand um, we have a, 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 an, a larger understanding that all Black people are different, Black people have different ideas, different likes, different dislikes. But there comes a time where with the age of the internet and the age of like, you know, we grew up with Smash Bros and we grew up with inter, uh, unders, we grew up in underprivileged communities where we had to make our own fun. There are points and times where like I felt, damn, I don't fit in with these people and they look just like me. They would call me when I was younger, you know, Chinese, uh, you were an Oreo, you had good vocabulary. There was always a differentiator being brought to me. I never thought about my blackness as being the reason behind it. Skipping forward, I became a teacher and I started to recognize that the same issues that I was dealing with as a child, children have always been dealing with. There's always a room to fit in beyond like your likes and dislikes. And it is set upon you by your experiences. I'm sorry to say this, but if you and a white child are raised, if a black child and a white child are raised the exact same way, their lives still won't be the same because you are going to hit a wall, hit a person that's going to tell you hey, I don't want to loan you this house. I don't want to do this. I, and for me, it's like at that point, if you know that one of those people exists, whether they're outwardly racist, inwardly racist, just don't like you know anybody under a certain shade, for you to participate in any behavior that, that aligns with that methodology, that aligns with that ideology, it pisses me off because you, you can't be that dumb. Like if people are calling you out on behavior and nobody ever calls you out before, maybe it's time for retrospect. And I'd like to ask you um, a question, actually. Do you feel like you have been heard correctly throughout this entire ordeal? Or do you feel more like people are filtering the knowledge that you're trying to impart through their own lenses and then not recognizing like, Oh, they, like the conclusion that they're reaching is not even remotely near yours, yet they're equating it the same way. Do you feel like you've been listened to properly this entire time? Oh, no. Um, I'm sure some people I've seen, you know, I've been in and out of the conversation. Um, I've seen some obvious bad faith interpretations, plenty of overt lies. Um, and then, you know, a handful of a decent amount of people are clearly reflecting 
uh, how I feel about, you know, the whole of the situation, at least the parts I've spoken on. Um, so overall, I don't know, 60, 40. I, I bring that up because um, it's not a criticism of you. It's more of a criticism of myself. And it reflects, I think, on all of us. I feel like we be engaging with a lot of goofies. I feel like I feel like people are being dense on fucking purpose. They will hear black people all say the same shit through a different lens. You know, I grew up in a white neighborhood, but I still understood that I wasn't accepted by them. I grew up in Harlem. I was the the smart nerd kid who always was interested in this, that, and the other. Um, I under completely understand, like, but there's a level of obtuseness that I think is happening in this conversation. And I know how dumb it is for like us to go now back to, well, it's the way we're having the conversation. I've dealt with this before on Twitch. I've dealt with this before on YouTube. I think you, I'm not gonna say you much older than me, but you were around for the Jerry Purple drink, the, the adpocalypse, the King Batch moving from Vine, getting the money, selling out. We've had these conversations so many times. And I'm just saying, based on what I've seen and the people that you've engaged with, I think everyone took this conversation out of you in bad faith because that's what they need to do. They're bored. They can't empathize with us in a level of discussion that just makes them feel educated. There's got to be a debate. There's got to be another side. And I'm like, I'm sorry to tell you this, but like to bring it to a, a, a real situation, like I watched people say that Jordan Neely should have died. And it's like, what do you think that's a part of? Do you think that that's all disconnected opinions just all coming? No, that's a part of that side that you're capping for when you say small things like fatherless behavior. When you say small things like, oh, uh, 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 white people have treated me better. You know, we got to be more like the white community. We got to put money in. The I just remember watching a video of yours, uh, I think, yesterday while I was probably money in the black bag. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like all four okay, black banks all, in the whole country. All this, all this is great ideas, but like we still live here every day. We still live here, so like, don't tell me that you don't understand what I'm saying when I say you exhibiting coon behavior. Because like, you're <laughs> going to reach a point where your audience, somebody's going to seep in there and say that one line to that one person. Then that gets clipped out of context. Then we're that gets clipped, and we as a, and I'm not saying we're a monolith. But like we as content creators, whether big or small, I think we need to approach these goofies with like a blazing fist. I think we need to just stop like giving them the benefit of the doubt and just be like, look, I know this is going to get clipped out of context. I know y'all going to do your little, you know, three, four panels on me. Bunch of white but people telling you that you're racist against black people. <laughs> yeah, like, like, I'm sorry, you're not black. You don't get that conversation. I've been called it. And I understood where that was coming from, whether it was their bias on thinking that white people might be better than them in vocabulary, money or whatever, or whether it's my behavior. I can still see a connection where it's like, oh, you're not checking my black card. You're just telling me an action I'm taking might lead to me defending another action, defending mm -hmm. another. There's somebody going to come up and ask you, yo. What's up with your boy? Yeah, that, like, that's, <laughs> I'm sorry. That was what, so the funny thing here. that was <laughs> the 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 uh, Daniel Kaluuya side eye tweet. That's what that means. Abba, what's up with your boy? Why is he? What, you don't see this, like. <laughs> right. It's a rule that I have. Like when I say I hang out with people, don't make me ask you. What do you mean by that? What because it brings it to a whole level of it's not that I'm saying you're stupid and, and I'm not trying to degrade you. I'm not saying you know, I, I, I'm on the internet, I ingest a lot of information, I can come to conclusions quicker based on what I've learned. But like, there's no way you 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 gonna make me Google search something to tell you this is what it actually is, and then you're gonna sit there and tell me, no, well, this is a specific case. No, your behavior is like I'm not calling you that. If you want to own that the same way I tell all these you know, January 6th supporters, MAGAs, whatever. You don't got to own that part of the conversation. You choose to sit there and be like, no, this is my spot. Right. We're, We're not a monolith. That's why I, I have said to agree. Country. And that's why that argument, um, uh, I forgot your name already. I'm bad with names, bro. 
paradigm. It's okay. Paradigm. Uh, a lot of people have said that we should have met for a long time now. So <laughs> I, well, I see why. I'm not, we're gonna have to circle back. Um, so one thing I wanted to get into that we haven't touched on yet that you I don't know if you alluded to it, but it's something I've seen and felt is there's also an insecurity uh, in terms of the the community throwing the label out. Like when you, excuse me, so I had a big vocabulary. So please believe y'all, I haven't had a lot of experience with being from the time, but I remember a couple of moments being like, what does that word mean, FD? Where you get that word from? You know what I'm saying? There, there's a, you know, and that was partly because here I was, this kid from the south suburbs of Chicago, walking with my cousins on the south side of Chicago, using the big words that I had got from my Encyclopedia Britannica that my mom bought me, that my cousins and some of these other folks, parents maybe couldn't afford. And you don't, like, Black folks don't have a very good class analysis, and you definitely don't have that shit as children. And so what I internalized and what I was told was that some of these kids, you know, when you start using those big ass words, people feel like you're trying to shit on them. People feel like you're trying to, to, to rank on them. Um, and like, let's not act like sometimes that's exactly what it is. There's been a few times where I learned a new word and my cousin got, got, got on my nerves and I, and I pulled that shit out. They said, you don't even know what that means, do you? Right? So this is this is a two way conflict on levels. I want to make sure are injected. Um, I did um, I did allude to that. I just figured I didn't have enough time to like get. No 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 no. We definitely a little bit more. But, um, little bit more. To, right. Yeah. Uh, it goes deeper than that. Um, when you are in a classroom full of people who have not been entered, like, and this was my growing up, my experience. When you're in a classroom full of people who have never heard like the word vernacular. They look at you like you're specifically, and my dad tried to pull this shit on me too. They look at you like you're specifically trying to pick on them by using words they don't know. And yeah. it's that reflex that is not only burdened on you by being a child because, oh shit, an adult has probably done that to you at some point, And now you feel like I'm doing it to you, but like, it's not my fault. It's not your fault. It's never been our fault. The moment, and I say this to everybody, I'm sorry, I'm jumping from point to point because I'm trying to hurry up. Um, I say this to everybody, everything that happens on this in this earth, on this earth is just a conversation. You say something to somebody else, that person says it to somebody else, and all of a sudden the war starts. Mm -hmm. Like you, it takes a little bit of time to get that introspect to understand why you had that reaction. But by the time we're 18, and yes, this is an argument for why we should teach critical race theory in schools. By the time you're 18 and you get thrust into college, you're going to meet that one black dude from the south side of Chicago who's going to be like, who the fuck? Um, um, I don't know if you're a fan of battle rap, but uh, Smack, oh, yeah. who is this? Who is this? <laughs> <laughs> right? like, and it's yeah. like, it's not your fault. But the reaction you first have will make a basis for the rest of your reactions. Mm -hmm. And I wish we could take that introspect and be like, hey, look, we have the internet now. We've got uh, seven uh, really top big uh, black cons uh, content creators that are making this type and this type and this type. Hey, let's add a couple comments. Let's make a response video in that way. Let's share our experiences and then find somebody to put a compilation together. These are just small ideas off the top of my head. But the larger point is, when you exhibit that behavior, it calls into question, what ha what else do you think about? What do you mean by that? And that follow-up is the problem with trying to have this discourse because then enters destiny, enters uh, 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 all these other people. And right. they'll take that and take the worst side of it. And you know you didn't say that. But then somebody enters your chat. Somebody enters your comments. It becomes a thing. Twitter gets in a way. And it's like you feel the need to respond to it because there's no way you don't understand this. Mom's getting sore, yes. Right, yeah. <laughs> like, there's no way you don't understand this. And you have to understand it. I'm not saying you have to agree to it. But if we're supposed to be, and I know that this is another thing, like Black people going with Black people, if we're going to have these enter conversations and then invite other people. We got to understand mixed company don't always work. Right. They're going to hear right. it and say, it is also, it's okay to be racist to everybody. And it's yeah. like, do you see me hating him because he's black? 
No, he's exhibiting white behavior. Ain't that part of him? <laughs> yeah, this, this, this problems. Paragon, uh, thank you so much, man. I want to let you go. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And get mother home here. All right. Um. So, um, I just wanted to start off by saying I kind of want to make this kind of quick. Um. Um, because uh, I do have some, not necessarily disagreements, but I would just like to discuss more. Um, uh, my name is Batson. I'm 20. I'm tw I'm 26. Um, uh, I currently work a nine to five. I don't have any college uh, background at all. Um, never went. Um, but I would consider myself a baby, a baby leftist, and. Um, in you know in 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 a specific way but um but i i did send you an email and in that email i basically uh stated what you stated previously that there were some insecurities around that word uh, around the word and um if i could reiterate uh you know just a little s subsection of that um it's mainly i have uh an issue with the seemingly flippant use of it in certain um leftist spaces um leftist uh, spaces you know it can either be from you know especially in regards to the word um it's uh, uh you know it, it, it's used by by you know by black and white people and you know i feel like uh, accusation as serious as that um well at least as serious for a black person to be called that i feel like that is a very serious accusation um uh, i feel like something like, like that um should be reserved for um for things that that are i, I you know for things that should be considered like actual uh uh Coonery, for lack of a better term, um, you know, stuff like, you know, you know, people with an actual clear record uh, of anti-Black advocacy and anti-Black behavior. Um, and, you know, yeah, yeah and, and this whole conversation really just started um, for from, you know, the Soul Bunny video. I, I could bring that up. Um, but, you know, this is kind of what started this whole thing. Um, with Soul Bunny calling Shark, uh, famous streamer Shark, uh, a coon. And I don't necessarily that label, well, I don't necessarily think that label fits Shark. And I don't think it was a correct label to, to say, um, you know, in regards to that. Um, but, you know, I could be wrong. I am open to being educated on this. And, um, you know, I, I don't want this to be like framed like some sort of debate or anything. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, so, I, and I wouldn't um, want to, I don't want to farm shark, farm shark for actual content when me and shark could talk directly uh, too mm -hmm. tough. Um, I, I'll give a general overview. I guess my direct feeling is to, to the specific question and try to lead Shark out of it as much as possible. So um, I agree with a lot of what you said, which is that like, so first off, nobody white should be saying the word. And you shouldn't be, I saw some of y'all motherfuckers like write it with a star in it on Twitter. Like, no, there's a lot of other words you can say. You can say sellout, you can say pick me, you can say anti-blackness. There's a lot of other options you got. Uh, you, if you if you if you cannot be considered a coon or a uncle Tom, you should not be using that word, right? So like, I want to put that out there to begin with. You know, what I'm saying some of y'all may not have known that. Now you know. You know, we'll we'll start here and, and go further from there. Uh, so that said, I don't think we're going to have a perfect definition of, because I, I think I would agree with some takes I've heard, and I don't know if you insinuated this, but like, coon is like the highest level of pejorative a black person will say about another black person. Like, mm -hmm. like I will call somebody a Uncle Tom or a sellout, you know what I'm saying? A couple things. To be called a coon 
you got to do some shit like pretend you donated to police. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I get with you on the gradient scale. I don't want to get into semantics of calling Shark a cool. Um, I definitely don't agree with the... I, I'm, I am not on the side of Shark in terms of the reasons why others felt the need to call him a coon. Like I want to be, I don't want to get caught up in a semantics battle. What I do think is more important is to discuss how other black folks who would consider themselves uh, on the left or progressive or pro-black or whatever can exhibit very clear anti-blackness under that veneer, right? So getting away from Shark, somebody who I think is an Uncle Tom is like Van Jones, right? Van Jones is a liberal. He is left-leaning, right? And that's not what makes him Uncle Tom because I wouldn't call the average Black Democrat up Uncle Tom. I'm not that far left, right? But Van Jones in particular serves as a mouthpiece for white liberals to uh, create barriers and um, a certain viewpoint of more uh, radically pro-Black sentiment in the mainstream media. He's the first person to jump out and be like, I want to apologize to all of my peers for Kanye West. And it's like, man, yeah. I, Kanye, a lot of problems. Definitely, <laughs> and everybody, nobody is with Kanye West right now. You do not have to take it upon yourself to jump in front of a crowd and say, hey, white people, I just want you to know we're sorry for Kanye West, right? Um, and, and stuff like that is clearly very anti-Black. Um, and so with Sharp's situation, I wish we could have had a conversation at each of these intervals where I could have explained to him why he was getting the response he was getting. And that just didn't happen. Um, I feel like on some level, Sharp would understand, you know, if if the temperature was lowered, I would hope that Sharp would understand why a lot of Black people are coming at him with this energy. Um, and if I'm empathetic to Sharp, I can imagine that Sharp's Black experience, and I want to be clear, this is never about not being Black. You cannot be an Uncle Tom if you're not Black. Uh, but I would want, I, I want to be empathetic to Shark's specific uh, uh, experience of blackness as to why he's consistently landed on these issues the way he does. Um, but, you know, to kind of hopefully answer your question and, and to give the floor back to you, uh, from my, in my opinion, there's a, a, a gradient scale, right? Um, a, a bell curve on, you know, where, anti-blackness uh, land and how deep into the shit are you getting? You know, like it starts from Jesse Lee Peterson and goes all the way to, I'm sorry, it ends with Jesse Lee Peterson and comes back to, I don't know, like because nobody is as ridiculous as Jesse Lee Peterson. I don't know. Yeah. Then we're getting into like no, weird, you that know, is... but you, you get my point. Mm -hmm. um, I want to give you one more chance to, to, to speak on it and I want to move on to um, man and then to whomever is left. Oh um, no, um, uh, no. I, I I I agree with most of what you said there. Um, uh, again, um, you know, I, I really do. I really do want to make this quick. But um, if you could, um, because there are um, black, uh, there are some. I would imagine some, if not very few. Um, black people in this space um who do have kind of the same mindset that shark does um when 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 it when it comes to their you know well yeah when, when it comes to their expression of uh of their blackness um and i i know you said that you know if you were able to sit shark down one-on-one -on -one, you would like to discuss you know stuff you know why he would have gotten that experience. Well, yeah, yeah, I've gotten that kind of feedback from uh, people. Uh, if you could, do you think you'll be able to, uh, uh, you know, you know, 
you know, educate me on why he would have gotten that response from. No, I don't want to do that right now. Public. Gotcha. Okay. I'll just okay. say okay. when you, okay. um, if you are in a position as a black person where there is a conflict and everyone that agrees with you is white, the vast majority of people that agree with you are white and the other side of conflict is predominantly black. I'm not saying that you can't think different, but understand that that tends to be what anti-blackness looks like. You know, when like, a collective of very different black people. Like, we are not a monolith. But if we can all agree that this was not the move and the people that agree with you are also the people that we're telling you are, are doing the racist shit and they're pushing you out there. Like, I want to, like, again, want to reiterate one of the things that you can let um, my man go. Thank you so much, uh, brother. Um, one of the things I want to reiterate, and then I want to get to this 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 comment right here, is the, the Soul Bunny's video was about Vosh and Keppels and other white leftist streamers, and these motherfuckers hyper focused on Shark, and they made it about Shark. That is a very blatant tactic that white supremacists like to use. It's how um, you know, it, it's why we have terms like Uncle Tom and clone and sellout or whatever, because we understand and know that the way white supremacy works, the first person they're gonna put forward uh to block from white supremacy is their token black person and say this nigga agrees with us. Why do you niggers not agree with us? You know what I'm saying? And and they did that to Shark, and it's fucked up. And I almost feel bad that Shark caught the the heat he caught because in a in a more strategic mindset, we'd have caught that and be like, "No, y'all not gonna throw Shark out as bait to get us mad at Shark." We talking about yo ass, you know what I'm saying? And but at the same time, when you when you step up to deflect from you know white. Uh, to, to be a, a shield to white supremacy, um, to people being detected. If you step up to be like, my white friend's not racist, and I'm going to get this better in a second, but if you stepped up to be like, my white friend's not racist, look at me, then you're putting yourself out there to catch that heat, especially if your white friend keeps doing racist shit. Um, you know, but uh, man, go on and introduce yourself while I change up this better. Hey, it's Man Lightfoot, otherwise known as Man of a Thousand Thoughts. That's M A Double N of a Thousand Thoughts on YouTube. And like to discuss with this anti blackness stuff, like I was like seeing all this stuff happening with Shark and everything. Keep, like it was weird to see, but the fact of the matter is, is like I wasn't fully aware of what was going on. The most I know, the gist is like. He, I think, defended Walsh in a sense, and now people are throwing. And it seems like, from what I can gather from context, at least, is that he basically got thrown under the bus because of this. Even though it's like maybe don't. Sure, it's like don't oh, be so. I'm sorry, quick. man. I'm sorry to cut you off. I want to address this comment about mm -hmm. like how white interlocutors uh, do this bullshit. Mm -hmm. Um. So here is this person's comment. Jesse Gender liked a racist tweet against Vosh. Now, I don't know who called, I'm sorry, against Shark. That's not a Freudian slip. Um, I don't know who called uh, Shark a coon. Oh, it was Lil Bill. <laughs> it was fucking Bill. So Bill, and I don't even think he called Shark a coon in the comment. He just um, put that picture of uh, Leonardo DiCaprio and uh, Samuel Jackson um, in uh, Django and, and said, I'm going to say this is Shark Zero, some shit like this, right? right. That's right. not Yeah, I saw that. Right? Not nice. Um, it's not fucking racist. <laughs> and the audacity, the sheer unmitigated goal 
take my headphones off for this shit. <laughs> the audacity, the sheer unmitigated goal for these white leftists that consistently let obviously racially insensitive, outright overtly racist nonsense pass through their mouths and their spaces and their tweets and their reddits, etc. For them to suddenly pearl clutch at other black people using insular black terminology to describe black phenomenon and try to police us on which terminology is okay and which one is not, is that bullshit. It's complete bullshit. So shout out to Jesse Gender it, for, for Jesse's safety for, for the future for all white folks because Caucasian is going to Caucasian. I would not do that in the future just to keep yourself from getting heat because they're looking for bullshit to target to just deflect from the reality of the problem. They're always going to find the 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 least charitable, low hanging fruit version of a problem and frontline that so that they don't have to talk about the reality of the situation. So, you know, don't do that in the future, but please understand that wasn't Jesse Gender liking a racist tweet. Jesse Gender agreed with Lil Bill's assessment that Shark Zero was deflecting from legitimate racist tendencies from the street, the big streamer community and showed that through liking the tweet. All right, and like, sorry about that, man. Uh, no, nah, it's cool. But yeah, like to go off of all that, like it's one of them things where because you see this constantly and it feels like and i was stuck discussing with like a uh, awestruck box at the round table well uh, well we will briefly talk about this because he mentioned like everything just feels so off right now with twitter like everything is turned all the way to a hundred right now on all types of shit and discourses like even in the cartoon space it's all wild and dumb takes all over and it's like what is going on and and with the shark thing and from going with the whole and people getting mad agenda just for actually agreeing about something that is actually correct it's wild because this is kind of a common thing and and it's co very common on from people on twitter like they want especially like white left to left this on twitter like complaining about stuff that's kind of not really a problem or sometimes they want to be the white knight of some sort or something like that. In this instance, they're trying to call Jesse Gender racist when it's like she liked a, a tweet. It was a funny tweet, a funny ass tweet from a black creator. Right. You know, and it, it's a, a correct Right. If Jesse would have posted that image, then I'd have messaged Jesse, yo, delete that. That's no right. Problem. Right. <laughs> that that's exactly <laughs> you know it. But like like liking it, the like is I agree. This exactly. looks like some sellout shit to me. Um, I this looks like internalized anti-blackness. Uh, and it's yeah, just just the, the, the audacity because because all this really is is white folks trying to find a way from deflecting from, like the whole way a lot of those communities talk about race and interpersonal racism. It's to frontline the parts of racism that take the most responsibility off of them. That's why, you, you know, I don't want to even rehash all the things that have happened, but that's why all those things that you're thinking about right now have happened. Because if they don't shift the conversation to, well, what about this cherry pit? If you think about it, hypothetically, situation, who's the real racist? Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because just the very nature of a bunch of white people telling black people that they're being racist against another black person betrays a misunderstanding of how racism works in this country. Right. Sorry. Right. It, it's just always that that quick charge because they're afraid to look inward you know a lot of these white leftists they want to think oh i fight for progressive policies and this and that and advocate and i understand you know the bullshit when it comes to police brutality and everything but they still don't want to look inward to make sure they they step in right you know they don't want to make sure that it's like oh wait am i act is what i'm doing what i'm saying stepping on the toes of black people in a sense because yeah we're not a monolith but you still want to listen to somebody who's gone through these experiences at the end of the day because they would have more of a know-how like i would always trust 
a person who's gone through the shit versus someone who's just read up about the shit, you know? Right. Like that's always that's always my thing. Like if right. you're just telling me you read a book on this and that, I'm like, okay, they maybe we read. <laughs> yeah, they don't they they don't read. Read. They they read read the black religion they neither talk nothing. about it. <laughs> Like, like, oh, shit, shit. like the sorry. niggas won't read. No, no, right. you cool. Like, because you're right. Like, the cool. niggas won't read the shit and they won't listen to other people who've gone through the shit because their thing is because they it's sort of that mindset of I don't see color, that type of shit. Like, I don't see race. Because yeah, race is a made up bullshit white supremacist concept that got made and of course, we shouldn't be judging people based on their color and such, but as the character, but you still have to recognize we are in a reality that has very much in <laughs> told ourselves we are all different in some sense. OK, like be, and we're going to do it in the most superficial way of noticing differences. We're not going to do it in the more complex way of understanding a person's actual personalities the stuff that they've actually gone through in life we're not judging none of that we just got to go first glance let me that's how i know you basically like right. your outside appearance rather you know, actually, than I don't how you come to this i'm gonna try to take conversation away from shark right now um so i have a question because you're in the cartoon community which is mm -hmm. like similar to the anime community maybe a little smaller and less prone to like the most extreme toxicity it's like y'all have normal arguments around race issues you know compared normal. to anime <laughs> yeah compared to anime <laughs> i guarantee you these yeah. cartoons are not normal yeah, I, I, they're not, I know they're normal. <laughs> but i know compared to anime it, it's not nearly as bad but but the thing that's because i didn't know a cartoon community was a thing like i saw uh you know the Tariq's favorite video how to black Everybody go watch Tariq's favorite video, How to Black. Don't do that, dude. Don't do that, <laughs> Um, I saw that years ago, and I thought it was a great video, despite Tariq's hatred of it. Um, but I didn't know there was a bigger cartoon community, which means there's also a bigger Black cartoon community. And oh yeah, when I think about... So here's a, here's the thing, and I, I'll pose this to you to help me develop my own thoughts, and this may be end up being a fucking video. So, um, <laughs> when we have these... You have niche spaces, then you have niche black spaces. What is it you think that happens in these niche spaces which get which attracts? You know, I guess we kind of know, but like have is this take correct? Do you think niche spaces, Bellamy, what are you doing? <laughs> I was like, I'm like, what's happening? <laughs> You <laughs> made me think my computer was crap in the sun. <laughs> like, what's happening? Like, he's uh, just sunsetting. Do you think niche spaces tend to be a beacon for Black folks with unprocessed, internalized anti-Blackness? Because if we're talking about the Black left, we're talking about the cartoon community, the anime community. Well, no, because like we also got like motherfuckers that watch academics and have been breached. So... Maybe that take doesn't hold up on the scrutiny. So, but, but I don't know what do you think. I think because I guess speaking a little bit from my own experience, like when I found out more about the black cartoon community, I was coming in as thinking, in a sense, I, I figured I wasn't truly correct on this, but like, hmm, I'm kind of one of the only few doing it like this. And then I meet this this dumbass jackass named Dub D Dub Man of Review Your Life. He's a boy. Like I meet this nigga, we collab, and it's like, okay, yeah, I found I'm found another peer, and then I find out he's on How to Black with Tariq, and I'm finding out, oh, there's another guy, and he actually spit some good shit, and then and that led me somehow to Veritas Joe and finding him when he was way smaller, he was even like had less subs than me, and that nigga ended up surpassing me somehow. But I heard you because I shouted him out <laughs> a while back. Like I, I say, I don't give a, just brag myself for a little bit. Of, but like that made me realize this community is a lot bigger. And it was like some months later after we like me, Dub and Tariq collaborate and do a whole big video talking about obscure black cartoons. 
we we were like, let's consolidate like the whole community in a sense, you know. Let's get let's get us all together. And we made that. We made the BCC, the Black Cartoon yeah. Community, and it and it it did it it could feel like some of that could be from the anti whiteness and for and it can feel like that. But for the most part, we came together because we were very appreciative of blackness. Like we right. were very much like unapologetically black. Like the way Tariq and Dub would be talking, that like rung a bell with me. I'm like, mm. oh my god, they're niggas who like the same shit as me, and they talk in ebonics too. Right, Fuck just yes. like me for real. Yes, they just like me for real. Like I had that revelation, and because I was because uh, I grew up in a predom- I was all I was pr- very much in a predominantly black, uh, like like you pretty much like growing up it's like all black all black schools from elementary to high school and yeah if you were if you were like a nerd like you like and i was like niche nerd because i like uh cartoons and right. most people weren't even feeling yeah, that anime look, anime niggas be looking at sean like mm. yeah because we had the anime <laughs> club there were no cartoon clubs right. you know what i'm saying so like it, like we were basically bottom bottom of of the tier list and like we managed to but we found but we were like okay we just kind of coast like the way dub talking the way Tariq talking the way i'm talking we just are like most of us are coasting a bit Tariq, though he was a bit more prominent because you know he had artist he had the artistic skills and everything and you know he make he's making his doing this and that making a name for himself in his high school time but for me it was like i'm just around I exist. I do like some black things. It wasn't always like that. Like growing up, I was a little bit like mm, not feeling black culture, but it wasn't. Until, but growing around black people, it's like no, you gr- you very much appreciate where yeah. you're coming from. It's familiar, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks, and, uh, man. I'm gonna let you run, um, so we can get. So, uh, Bellamy, just pick whomever because I can't. I can't tell who was who. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, okay. Go ahead and introduce um, yeah, uh, my name is Solomon. Um, I'm a college student at an art school. Uh, I've been watching your videos for a minute. Uh, I'm not like a content creator yet, although I might try. Um, I, I'm going to keep this brief because I think I'll be able to talk to you. But like, honestly, I think my only issue is that I'm not sure if the term coon is like productive. Like, if you're trying to convince Black people that their ways might be a bit, like, not in line with what will help them or, like, self-hating, yada, 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 uh, I don't know if calling them a coon is, like, the best way to go about that. Like, I've... So, backstory, lower time. Um, I was raised with, like, in a strong Black household, but I was, like, academically segregated from my Black peers. Like, because I tested out of... Um, all the introductory classes. I was always put in like the all white classes. I was the one black dude in all these classes, yada, yada, yada. So I have a similar thing with these with everybody here where it's like, uh, just because the education system, I was put into a different class essentially. Um, and because of that, I've been around whiteness so much. I've been called like, yeah, yeah. I've been called like one of the good ones. Like, oh, you're so articulate, yada, yada, yada. So there's that pressure from white people but honestly, it's been a lot of pressure from like black people too, uh, like in the whole like you act white, you're an Oreo, you're a coon type thing. Um, and you know, I'm not gonna say I don't have any inside blackness in me because we all do. We all internalize shit. You know, when I was really really young, my mom told me that I came home and I, I was five years old, and she was I was like, why does my hair not look as good as the white kids? And she's like, what? And I was like, why does my hair not look like look good as the white kids? And like, even at that young age, I was indoctrinated in some anti-Black bullshit, right? But being called a coon by the Black people around who I was trying so desperately to fit in with, and I was trying to, like, uh, be a part of, be a part of the community, it didn't make me feel any more Black. It made me feel like, oh, I'm Black, but I'm an other type of Black. It was, like, it was an othering of my Black experience. And I don't even think I did anything super coon-like. Like, I wasn't, like, hail Trump. It, I was it like, hey, much. I like cartoons. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, which is also kind of why I wanted, no, no, yeah, no you're right. I, I kind of want to like, I know you said you didn't want to do semantics, but like, 
a definition on coonery or anti-blackness would be helpful because the term is so amorphous and so like means anything you want it to mean that anybody could be labeled a coon just the way anybody could label a Nazi on Twitter. So it's like, what am I doing that is coonery to you people? And on top of that, like, is that actual valid coonery or do y'all just like not like to see black people who don't speak in abonics, that kind of vibe? I don't know. I, I feel like if you call someone a coon, you are taking away their black card. And it's like, that's a card white people gave us in the first place. Why is this so important? Why are you trying to other people that you feel empathy towards? That kind of vibe. I'm not a fan of the word coon or like using it in that way, but I do see the importance of calling out and say black behavior. Does that make sense? No, that makes a lot of sense. A lot of things you, you said make sense that I want to engage with. So uh, I guess let's start with like a little history and definition. Like coon comes from zip coon which is uh, a minstrel character mm. in a song. Uh, and I can't track the full etymology, um, but my best right, estimation yeah. is that this minstrel zip coon character, so if you're familiar, if you're familiar with minstrelsy, you know that it's, you know, black. Yeah, I'm familiar, yeah. yeah so, and so like, and they're getting up there and they're acting in exaggerated ways uh, of, of what white people see blackness to be, for white people's entertainment. So the, the original use of the word coon and cooning was look at this dude cooning for these white people. And basically like mm -hmm. my best, um, the definition I tend to cleave to is cooning is when you are a black person purposely um, doing harm, depicting black people in a particular way for the benefit and enjoyment and, uh, and appeasement of white people. Um, which by that definition is not fair to say to a black kid who doesn't, uh, who's never had grits, you know what I'm saying? Or who uh, doesn't know how to dance or isn't good at, you know, some stereotypical black thing. Um, so like, I yeah. agree. I that, can't play basketball. You're right, right, neither, neither can I. Um, like, I agree that there should be um, nuance to not so much who we label cool, but how we engage in responding to anti-Blackness from Black people seeking community, right? I think the semantics of yeah. the all the... Yeah. Go ahead. I was just going to say, like, yeah, yeah, if you if, like, I am all for calling out anti-Blackness. I just don't think saying the word coon does that in a way that's productive. Like, instead of, nigga, you a coon, could it be more like, uh, hey, this action is promoting anti-blackness. Like, hey, can you check that? Like, even the thing, you see something earlier about like, hey, check your man, something like that, that's less like, less extremely pejorative and less of a word that like white people threw on us in the first place. Like, I know we, we, I know we reclaim nigga to be like a positive thing, but we haven't reclaimed coon in the same way and we're just using it yeah, that's the word the colonizers gave to us to like uh, to objectify us. So like, why are we trying to do the same thing to our people? Essentially, and that's what that's my point with that. And it's for the same purpose. I know it's catchy it's on Twitter. Yeah. Well, no, I yeah. don't know about I'm on Twitter. It, no, it exists for the same purpose. Um, as is a, so like, and that's kind of the complex thing. The nigga, the n word, a a version has been reclaimed and repurposed for different mm -hmm. use. Coon has been reclaimed, but not really repurposed. And that's why it hurts so bad. You yeah. Know what I mean? yeah. Um, because yeah. to call somebody a coon, you got to mean it. I haven't called Shark a coon because I don't need that much ill will yeah. to Shark uh, uh, at this point. And I want to have a conversation with him before I, you know, start getting into like you know, pejoratives against them, et cetera, et cetera. I, I call Abba a coon because, like, yeah. we cross the threshold. Um, but th there's a lot of validity in your right. Perspective. But I don't, I don't even know in, in that well, in in that situation. I don't know if um, like I watched um, so full disclosure. I don't want to sound like a traitor or anything, but like I've been a fan of you and Destiny for a minute. Uh, so I've, I've been on both sides. I know you said like on Twitter that this people can't exist, but I'm one of those people. Hello, it's, it exists. Um, when he found out that Destiny did that and, did, and donated to the police department, which I'm not a fan of that decision, but like neither was he. And he called Destiny out on that. He was like, hey, if this police department did some bad shit, wouldn't you feel bad about it? They had a whole conversation. 
I know he then ended up donating to the police department to be petty, but to be fair, at that point, like he was, he felt like you had already put him in the Uncle Tom camp. So that was just him being petty because like you had already put that on him. Whether or not he's a coon, I just, I, I know that like that was the situation there. So like I'm, I'm a little more in the middle on that because I know he only did that as a defense of, yeah. Defense of white person. <laughs> like that's the thing. Go ahead. You can go. Um, yeah. Like, so, so first off, let's, let me, let me, let me be clear. I've been preach have dabbled on, you know, centrist takes around race throughout all their content. Like they, they gave, uh, uh, space yeah. for the Asian, uh, brother, like Asian, the Asian guy a couple of months ago that went viral in his anti-black, anti-Asian hate from black people who really misrepresented the reality of the situation. They've done that on many occasions. And I've just been like, it's not egregious enough for me to um, make that a central critique. You know what I'm saying? Because it, it's, it's medium shit. It is what it is. I would never yeah. have... I would never have regarded Abba as a, and even as Abba hung with Destiny, because you know, no shade. Destiny does anti-black shit all the time, like all the time. He Destiny likes to make racist jokes where the joke is racism. You know what I'm saying? And the joke is look at me being white and racist and getting away with it. You know what I'm saying? It's like if. Like for example, like Bill Burr is a comedian that does a lot. Yeah, of that actually is. I, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Mm. You want me to jump back in? I had a I had a thing I was going to ask for quick actually. Go ahead. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Yeah, basically I was going to ask like, okay, so coon behavior right like and that that concept how how i'm trying to phrase this question can you be friends with white people especially problematic white people and still be like part of the black community like like what, what point do you lose your black car from being around a problematic white person because i have a lot of friends I, okay i'm from south carolina right like like greenville south Carolina. like it's it's very like it is it is dense and conservative in there, right? Like uh, my friends growing up, because I was in segregated classes, were these conservative-ish, like white people. Essentially, I had access to black people too, and tried to talk to them, but then I was called a coon. So, if your closer friends are these people, and by circumstance, like how how much can you associate with them about losing your black identity? Essentially, is what I'm trying to ask. Like, because I, mean, I don't want to like just diss myself from someone based on opinion. Yeah, but you, you call someone like, uh, you get thrown pejorative terms if you are with people. So it's like individual choice, but it's dictated by society by some amount. Like, you know, yeah, that's, I'm not that's, here on Nazis, but if I were, that'd be definitely yeah. human behavior. You know? No, I like that. I don't, I don't, I don't envy yeah. the situation that you're in. And I know that is a situation that a lot of black folks, especially young black folks experience. Um, that's the fly in the milk experience. I go back to my comments about Carlton um, in the Black Boy Hood video uh, where mm. Carlton didn't get to choose where he was raised and how he was raised. He's forced into a situation where he's surrounded by white people who are, I'm sorry, this is distracting me again. He's forced into a situation where he's surrounded by white people and these white people um, as whiteness tends to do in isolation from uh, other experiences, make it a point to be racially insensitive around him. And he has to choose, do I either be alone or do I keep my dignity in this regard? Um, and I don't envy that. I don't envy that at all. Um, however, yeah, it's kind of my situation right now. For whichever way you decide to go in that situation. And if you decide... Mm. So, you know, I won't begrudge you if you decide I'm going to make peace with having problematic white friends, um, you know, and figure this out piece by piece. I start begrudging you when you don't own the reality of that situation. And that's just my perspective. Like when, you know, I hear people try to say Destiny's not racist in the face of all the things that's like, tell me you're OK with Destiny's racism. And I'm not gonna fight you about it. I'm gonna look at you fine. I'm gonna give you that side out. That's what that tweet was about. 
but I'm not going to fight you about it because you're at least being critical and honest of the situation you're in, right? And that's the truth. And, 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 and I'm going to just be, be blunt. That's the truth with Destiny's Black fans. Destiny is racist. They're just okay with it. For whatever reason, maybe they've been desensitized to it. Maybe they think what he's saying is true. Destiny's, most of his Black, I, I would argue that a lot of Destiny's Black orbiters are Black conservatives. Um, he doesn't really, like Black people who are overtly pro-Black don't hang around Destiny too long and for a reason, because Destiny's racist and it's hard to be pro-Black when you hang with racist people. Um, pro-Black to a certain extent, I'll just say. Can I offer a... Um, because um, I can't hear you. Let me just finish what I'm saying. Um, so, like, in those situations um, where you say uh, X white person is my closest friend because of the circumstances of my birth and my reality, my childhood, whatever, my upbringing. X person also tends to be a little racist. And I haven't figured out a way to address that because if you tell white people they're racist, they act like they act like they're acting right now. No, yeah, I get it. Yeah. But yeah, you're forced to either do that or be alone because on the flip side, to your point, black folks who are not out of community with other black folks, we all have very, you know, rigid rules around that. And I would agree that we could relax those things and have better ways to bring other black people into community, um, to, uh, to address those isms and give them an alternative than their all face when they are, are suffering in this situation. We can definitely do better with that. That's why I want to have a full on conversation instead of just get on here and dunk on uh, ABBA a lot. But that's the yeah. situation that's in flux. Let me let me jump back on so I can let you speak. Yeah. Okay. Uh, my only the last thing I'll say on this is just what someone else to talk is that um, so I'm not aware of the racism Destiny has. I'll look into. It, I'll research it. Like this is new news to me. Um, if he is like a legitimate huge bigot, I'll look into that and I'll be like, all right, well, time to cut ties if I need to. All I know is that from what I've seen from watching a lot of his content and yours actually is that there's like, I have seen him be a positive change in de-radicalizing the very kind of problematic white people that I'm with in my state. Um, I've seen his arguments and his rhetoric, pro-black arguments, pro-black rhetoric, do that for people in which the audience do, because that crowd is more like a debate crowd and they'll be able to, uh, you know, I saw your video on debate bros. I remember you talking about this too. Seeing him do positive work and I respect that. But if he is a huge bigot, then I'll look into that and I'll, I'll just have from there. But um, thanks for having me on this. That's a really nice conversation. Thank you. Um, as you bring the next person in, appreciate you, man. I want to clarify something. Destiny's not a bigot. Well, he is a bigot too, but he's also a racist. And, and those are two different things. Um, and, it's, and it's about understanding the nature of racism will help you recognize it in Destiny. The way he centers himself in Black discussions, the way he platforms white supremacists, um, and gives them a greater reach in its audience. The way he makes racial humor, where the punchline is him getting away with being racist. Um, the, the fucking N-word debate, where he lost his one black friend and had to replace him with Ava. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is not a question of Abba, of, of uh, Destiny being racist. Um, it's a question of what is your threshold for dealing with that? And you can deal with that if you want. I've said over and over again, please watch, if you're, Destiny, if you're a Destiny fan, please watch him and me. You'll see the difference. I think the reason why people give Destiny so much credit for being such a, a strong force on the left is because the, the, the visible online left has, it's a very low bar. The, the bar is in hell. That's real. But now, that, oh, sorry, go ahead. But no, nah, that, that's all I want to say. I'm going to dip out because you got guests that want to chat. So I'm bringing up yeah. Pesto and I'm bringing up King's Effect. And then we got uh, Leo and Neon left. And it is up to you from there. Yeah, I, I try to get through. I see. I ain't, we ain't got to pick up the kids today. Um, oh, I forgot what I want. I want to respond to something you said there. And I lost it. Um, It is what it is. We got uh, two people up, Bellamy. I mean, want to go at the same time? Y'all want to do that? We can maybe get. 
Let's do that. Let's uh let's bring I, up two I, I and put, two. I put two of y'all up there, you yeah. know, respectful to attorneys, etc. Yeah. All right. What's going on? So I guess we'll start with uh homie that's on cam. Um, if you can state your name and then uh oh, okay. Oh, so um homie off the cam if you want to jump in there while yeah, I, I kind of wanted to talk about um, your taking it back to like your original take um, that kind of started a lot of this um, with the um, Killer Mike uh, video. Um, I didn't really understand your disagreement with it. Um, you're like, you said like, oh, black people don't have resources. While like, this is like, what he was saying is essentially like what I've like me being part of the immigrant community and like uh, like black being me being a black immigrant, um, like it's essentially what I've seen people around me do their like entire lives, like uh, being incredibly frugal, like pursuing education, um, uh working hard like being disciplined um and like i i think we can at the same time acknowledge that like that stuff actually works but also like advocate to raise the bar for where people start at um and i i think that was like um yeah that Sorry, that was like the primary I disagreement i had um with the original take and then yeah, yeah. I, I just want to so, hear like what yeah. if I was misunderstanding it or like yeah, you um, did. Um okay. So and, and here's why <laughs> here's why I don't fuck with Destiny. Uh when Killer Mike makes that take, and if you go back and you watch the video where I talk about it, I'm I, I thought I was pretty clear in saying just like you grew up around that, I grew yeah. up around that. I grew yeah. up around black people who were frugal and hardworking and disciplined. In fact, black people in general, even those most in poverty, most suffering from these issues are hardworking and frugal and uh, try, try to be as forward thinking as possible and want to get married and all those things. Mm -hmm. And that's why I hate when people say that shit as a solution to black problems. Because what, what happens here is when a person like Killer Mike especially, and to a lesser extent Destiny, since, since he's such a significant voice on black issues, when they say <laughs> that, it pulls energy and credibility from the structural critique of why I am here in this position and some of my cousins are not. And so yeah. if you are really about black issues, you should know that if you're telling black people to work hard and be frugal and all these mm. things, that you're not telling them shit they don't know. If you are in community with black people, you know that they know what the best behavior is supposed to be. That yeah, is, yeah. that's like me, this is, a, I'm trying to, let me not get too out of pocket with like comparisons, but it's like dropping a person, you know, in a desert and saying, what you really need is water. You know what I'm saying? It's like, thank you. I appreciate that. So I was never in disagreement with the value of the advice that Killer Mike gave. What I don't like is that when you frontline that argument, white conservatives and moderates and black conservatives will make it seem like, see, this is what black people really need. Not, yeah. you know, re reversing the, the reality of redlining and how that killed uh, black economic growth in this country. Not fixing policing. Not all the things I know you know. Right. Those are things that we can't get more than 40 
percent of the population to admit is a thing. We literally cannot get the average white person, the average, especially any white conservatives, to admit that racism is systemic. They're literally taking critical race mm, theory, which, by the way, is a mid theory overall. It's cool, but it's not the end all be all. They're literally taking that out of schools, which it was never in in the first place. So I'm not going to abide by you talking about personal responsibility at the same time where basic history and uh, social science around black issues um, are not being engaged with at a serious level. And someone said mm -hmm. someone responsive real quick. Then I'll, I'll, I want to hear it from my man and I'll let you jump back in. Um, uh, this is not true. As a teacher, you know, some black people aren't educated in the right mindset to have to be self included of course, is it because they're black? Is the lack of their <laughs> education on that mindset intrinsic to their blackness, or is it because of their poverty? Mm -hmm. uh, can, I, um, can I ask before y'all go anywhere? Because I need to. It's easier for me to say this here and then in the chat. If you're making jokes, use tone indicators. You're going to get clapped. If it's not extremely obvious to us. We're getting rid of you. That's it. No discussion. No debate. That's it. Use tone indicators or get clapped. Go ahead, Pete. Yeah, that's really it. Like I, I, I've had kids. We we do a job interview class, and they and they come up to the class and and you know Jordans and the and the 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 A shirt, for, you know, AKA the white beater shirt, and it's like, no, this is not how you dress for a job interview. Let me let me inform you. Of course, that's the thing. That is a matter of access and teaching and knowledge and examples, et cetera, all of which exists significantly in black communities, all of which are just as real for white people who are underserved, uh, Asian, Latino, whomever. But when it comes to black people, we try to make it intrinsic to blackness. And if you do that to avoid engaging with the reality of the structures that make that reality not just possible but predictable um i guess it's best to let you speak back and then i'm gonna get to uh what's your, what's your name brother king's effect can you hear me yeah king's effect i want to let him respond okay and then I'm, we jump in with you yeah so all right i that that's something i've thought a lot about um there's like especially with like me growing up around like very like upper middle class like uh black immigrants where like they like it, it essentially like like when i talk to like like upper class like asian american or like other immigrant groups like i somehow feel like that my uh, experience matches them more than like uh, other black people in general. Like it's like it, that's definitely what it feels like. And like it probably. Does. I guess I yeah. And like it doesn't. I guess it might mean that I am missing part of that um, knowledge of like what black people are actually hearing in their day to day which I guess m maybe led to that um, misunderstanding. Yeah. So, um, and, and, and you would be, yeah. I hate to cut you off, but you would be like a lot of people that are not in community with black folks. You should watch some of yeah. Foreign Man's videos. The Foreign Man is also an immigrant and he's went through a similar experience of having a perception of blackness, not having experienced blackness. And it makes sense that an immigrant experience intersecting with a black experience would produce a different thing. You know, I don't, I don't police blackness to tell you your black experience doesn't count. Even if you're uh, yeah. Uncle Tom, um, that's a black experience, um, and it is going to lead to different. I'm not saying I'm not saying to insinuate that. Um, it is going to lead to a difference in um, how that comes together. Uh, Kings, mm -hmm. I probably fucked your name up. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. <laughs> Kings effect. Kings effect. <laughs> but you can say King Kings. I don't care. Okay, so um, I wanted to take it the conversation a bit off from I guess YouTubers and celebrities. Cause honestly, I'm not in I'm not in, in a community with them, and when I label them as coons, I don't I don't look up their shit anyway, so I don't care about them as much. They're adversaries to me. 
Uh, that's what I view the word coon as. Um, for me personally, I really wasn't called a coon ever. If anything, I was considered the opposite growing up. Mm -hmm. um, I was always the one who would speak out and proud about black issues. If the teacher was on some bull, I would call him out to the point where apparently uh, my name on a list of others was on a list of black of kids in particular where if we were set to, if we were, yeah, <laughs> but in a different way where it's, if something's being said, follow it up quickly or it'll become an issue because uh, our parents will follow up behind us. Mm -hmm. um, and I got told this from a teacher, not gonna say who, so he doesn't get in trouble. But um, that's the kid I was. So I never really cared for, um, I never was, viewed as a coon, maybe a non-Black person would say that I speak well, and I would quickly answer why, um, or ask why. I wasn't that type of person. However, I will say that because of my uh, parents and my grandparents and my family who taught me a lot, taught me so much about Blackness and pro-Blackness, I thought of, I was thinking of myself as one because I was allowing a lot of anti-blackness around me when I was a teenager. And many of us as teens might not realize something was anti-black in the moment I did, and I still went with it. And that was fucking me up. Ooh, can I curse? You do. Can I curse? Okay. Yeah, you do. Um, so that was fucking me up um, a lot, um, especially after I graduated, because I didn't want, I did not want to be like everybody else. Um, that's something that I was prided myself on that made my family proud to some on a long list of family who went to HBCUs and colleges. So that's something we always do. We're always better than it. And I was kind of like, okay, obviously I'm not <laughs> I'm yeah. struggling with yeah. that. Cause I'm like, okay. Um, I'm definitely, even though, yeah, I'm not what other people call a coon. I definitely feel like I am cause I'm not speaking out against other black people and their anti-blackness. Um, and that was my problem. So I radically changed in um, first year of college. And the waking up point was when I was with two friends, well, two former friends, acquaintances who were white. Uh, we went to Virginia Beach, Virginia. If you know about that place, um, just know they killed uh, um, Pharrell's uh, uh, cousin there, mm. um, police. And no, the police did not get in trouble for it. That's that's Virginia Beach for you. And I was, when they were, um, we were going back to the car, they um, crossed the uh, cross, they didn't cross the crosswalk. I said, please cross the crosswalk. I'm black with you all. You will get me in trouble. I don't want to deal with the police. Cross on the crosswalk. You see all these other white people crossing. You cross with them. What are you doing? They, they jaywalked. And I'm like, Lord Jesus. Luckily, we didn't get stopped. But I'm like, oh, I'll never hang out with y'all again. I cannot mm -hmm. do it. No, I'm mm -hmm. not going to do this. And I'm just like, Lord Jesus, my, my coon ass had the, I, the dumbest idea to hang out with these two white folk who do not give a shit about black issues. This is stupid. Let me not do this anymore. <laughs> uh, oh, so. <laughs> that, <laughs> and that's, the, that's, the so thing. that's my oh, waking up point. <laughs> yes. Yes, 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 yes. This is a perfect point to jump in. <laughs> oh, no, that's, a, and that's, a, that's the other side to this equation. Because you said a lot of good things that shows the limitation of the discourse so far. One, um, the only <laughs> the only working class, uh, uneducated, non-black excellence black person that popped up, as far as I know, was a brother that was a uh, you know defending shark, which is you know not an ordeal, but it would it would be good to get the perspective of the people who suffer most from sellout. Uncle Tom behavior, which is not educated black folks most equipped to call it out, but the people that are always the main target of white supremacist aggression and violence, which is, you know, folks yes. who are not black excellence, right? Who do not have access yes. to, to, to vernacular, which is why I want to hold space on both ends because that's mm -hmm. how white supremacy works. We can't just have one version of this conversation. And the other thing is so funny. And I think, oh. go what, the other guy just wanted to no, you're, you're, when you hang with white folks, and like when we talk about like cornbread too, right? And you know, different creators creating black spaces, mm -hmm. there's always a handful of white people that just feel left, not just left out, but indignant that they're being left out. And I, I wish mm -hmm. some of them folks will understand this is a survival tactic. 
If if I don't right. recognize that Let you have certain understandings of blackness, I can't immerse you in the black space or put myself immerse myself in your space because I don't know which threat you didn't recognize that I've been recognized since I was eight nine years old. You know, literally, and not only that, if I tell you and you ignore it, oh, I can't be around you no more. You're gonna have me hemmed up. No, I'm not gonna do it. And I think that's also the thing about it. The the half part I wanted to talk about was I was also struggling with my anti, well, I think with my anti-black, but also my view of myself as a pro-black person, because I was also bi, knew it for a long time, but I wasn't in community with other bi people. Mm -hmm. um, many of us don't come out until far later in life. Um, I was one of the few who came out right after high school because I had made a plan. I was like, I'm not dealing with this homophobia and biphobia until I'm an adult. I'm not dealing with this shit in high school. Um, don't know how great that turned out, but <laughs> made that choice. And um, after that, I understood, okay, once I really understood myself as a black bi man, that's when a lot of the pro-blackness came out because it wasn't just me checking on black people, it was also checking my black people in our own spaces, like, hold up, we ain't about to disrespect other groups and other people who deal with different things and are black on top of it. We're not about to do it, not just about queer issues, but trans issues, disabled issues, class issues. I was born in middle class. Um, been born in middle class my whole life. I am not poor, even though, I mean, my job's whack. I'm not poor, never have been, and hopefully never will have to deal with that. That's not, so my pro-blackness came from, okay, let me include these other groups, including my own, and check others. And my thing about, the only thing about Coon that bothers me, not necessarily, you know, calling people like ABBA, which I'm not gonna lie, most of us pro, uh, most of us um, queer black people already realized that, and didn't care for him at all because he didn't give a damn about black queer folks. And that's usually the first indicator to me, you're a coon. But also that so many other black people, if they're socially acceptable, their coonery, um, as long as they don't go too far like voting for Trump or whatnot, their coonery's accepted. Um, mm. They can tear down some black issues. They can sell out a black person. They can do this and that. But guess what? As long as you that that black person makes you feel good, as long mm -hmm. as they talk in a way that makes you feel good, makes you um, like their blackness because it's performative. Say like the football players of the world, many of which do not get called out like many of these nerds um, <laughs> in the world, me included. But many of these nerds or just black people who aren't in community with us because they're easy targets. Um, mm -hmm. They're not the ones called out. Many of these people who are in music don't get called out. Many of the black people in academia who might be considered liberal or left-leaning don't get called out. Yet at the first chance, if they're able to jump over another black person, be the only black person in the room and get money and coin from that, they'll be okay. And that's my problem with, coon, with the word coon. I'm like, okay, yeah, this was easy. Fish to fry, yeah. this was easy. Let me get the big fish. They're the problem. Not this one little person who, I'm gonna be honest, ain't gonna, I'm not gonna deal with this person. They're not gonna affect me because I've worked with a black person um, just this past year and last year who was very anti-black, showed it, talked about it all the time. And I had had white people who was working with me, told me to help, so like, because I was a, a lifeguard, help certain kids because he wouldn't do it. He would lie to certain kids. So, mm -hmm. oh, we're not open yet, but wouldn't, wouldn't do that to a non-black person, especially if mm -hmm. their parents were around. I have to do that. I would have to check them or I would have to just be around them. And the kids know, they could tell, oh, this person likes me, this person respects me, this person don't fuck with me. And then they would say them by name. And I was told that. And I was just, I wasn't even full time. So okay. I think my okay. issue is, I'm gonna real quick um, and okay. end it. My issue is that, yes, Coon is, I'm not gonna lie, I love using the word too. It, it's a hard habit to crack shoot and i might say something worse like you know black face without the makeup that being said i'm not just going to call black people that who are nerds and who are relegated socially to the back i'm gonna call out these you know big celebrities and these big personalities or just someone who's cute that everybody wants to fuck um that too if i see that you would far rather sell somebody down the uh, the river just because you can get a leg up definitely Thank you. Um, I have a question. Go ahead, brother. Where can we find you? <laughs> I would like to know as well. Thank like you. you. That's what we're here. You for. can find me on um 
<laughs> this is a surprise. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, uh, Kings Effect, uh, Kings and then Effect. Um, and my actual uh, head, well, like profile name is Prodig Prodigy's Lawyer. I'll usually go by Prodigy on Twitter, but my at's Kings Effect. And you can find me on um, Instagram, the same name. I actually do plan one day one day to make a podcast. Don't know when that will not be today, tomorrow, or the next week, so I, I but no one day. Um, have you, yes. have you heard of the application Blue Sky? The what? Blue, Blue Sky. Sky. You know what that is? No. I'm going to DM you. We'll, we will talk. We'll circle back. Um, Perfect. Thing is we into the last you're, you're, I you're not you left out here to the left in the wind. We're, we're, we're bringing you along. That's all I'm yeah. As we get the last two folks queued Thank up, you. I just want to, in response to uh, King's uh, last comment, the Black conservative series that I did mostly ignores the typical coons. Um, I did that for clickbait, uh, but the first one- Yes, I did see that. Yeah, yeah, and that second part, I mean, basically what you're saying is a big deal for me because I recognize it probably later in life um, because I was, deeply rooted in that black excellence mythology. Um, so it was harder mm. for me to like identify how, like I, I can hear the anti-blackness, but I didn't theorize a world where I had other options to reduce it other than calling people out. And so that second video is mm -hmm. the ref a reflection on that journey. But thank you so much, King. I want to get to the last folks because I am starting to wear now. I'm out of school. Uh, we're going to do that. Kings, uh, do me a favor. Thank, Thank you. Check so your Twitter DMs. We will talk. All right. Y'all have a blessed day. Peace and blessings. All right, gentlemen. Uh, I'm up next. Yeah, I guess so. Um, we'll just state your name and just kind of jump into uh, where you want to take it. And yeah, I, and thank y'all for waiting quick. so long, by the way. Yeah, no problem. I'll keep I, it yeah. quick so you could, uh, you know, get another smoothie after. But uh, name is Marvin. Go by Leon as well. Got two names. Uh, I want to keep, I got like three main points I really want to go over. Because uh, I feel like people like me aren't really represented in this space whatsoever. Uh, off the bat, raised out of poverty, uh, South Central LA, right? Most of the people that kind of have been on, I want to say they're middle class type, like, you know what I'm saying? Probably was listening to, what's his name? Like Childish Gambino talking about like, Cold to black, too black for my, too white for my black friends. Like, you know, that whole spiel, whatever. I never was really ever called a coon. I was probably the people calling people a coon when I was little. So I'm like these people's worst nightmares, right? Um, I'm of the opinion that I'm not exactly the, unnerdiest person like i'm pretty nerdy like i play games i was playing smash all that right i never was ever shunned by my black peers not a single time for a single second the only time i would ever hear that type of language is if like a white person was talking to me and they were trying to tell me like oh you, you don't sound black or something like you know what i'm saying like you don't you're not like that or whatever i would only ever hear that from white people i was always accepted and welcomed by my black peers uh, granted, I think what's happening here is most of these people have social anxiety that are in these spaces. Mm -hmm. And when you have social anxiety, you end up getting bullied, period, if you're white, if you're black, right? So they kind of take that and take that getting bullied part and turn it into some anti-black, like some little bit of anti-blackness. Right. Uh, I'm of the opinion, to keep it like succinct, I'm of the opinion that blackness is something that needs to be policed. OK, it's very easy to be a coon. It's extremely easy to be a coon if you're not African-American as well. I think that makes it a lot easier for you to be a coon. Like you were saying earlier, or I think it was an immigrant child saying earlier, like I was relating more to my uh, Asian friends or something like that. or like my uh, my white friends that were middle class. I was relating more to them than I was to black people. And it's like, yeah because you're not really, you know, you're your, not your experience is different. Yeah. You, yeah and that's not, why, and I, that's my whole space. Like mm -hmm. I've never been another thing that like being clear, um, like I've never gotten into like the ADOS FBA ideology because I don't find it useful, but I understand the undercurrent of 
how black immigrant experiences don't always match up with black American experiences. And that creates like points of conflict. Mm -hmm. And in those points of conflict, it's often the black Americans that are in the in the lower spot, which mm -hmm. means, you know, it's 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 no surprise when you look at you know college admissions, um, economic uh, situations for uh, black immigrants that those things tend to be out of whack. Um, so yeah, I, I, I get it. I just always want to make it where we we hold the nuance that is explicitly a conflict of of, of standpoint. Right. Um, I don't like to. I don't because we start getting the the the, the Tariq Nasheed's, uh too strong, and then I got to have a whole different conversation. Yeah. But go ahead. But yeah, that's that's really that's like that's it. it it's easier. I want to say it's a little easier for non-African Americans to slip up like that, which is why you yeah. get people like Drake being the number one influential rapper of all time, not saying a single peep on black issues ever. You get people like Abba, for instance, very easily being a coon. Like it's just tends to be a little easier for them. And then that's just for a good reason. And I want to say that's because blackness in of itself isn't real. Whiteness isn't real, right? These are two things that are, almost pretty much entirely unique to America. So when people are referring to white people or when people are referring to black people, that conversation is an American conversation. They're generally referring to American white people and they're generally referring to African-American black people, right? right? So I think that that's something that needs to be talked about a little extremely more uh, because we get we get these weird like conflicts where white people are feeling comfortable policing black people and policing other black people. And it's just <laughs> it's like, it's like y'all don't even know what you're talking. Like you, not at all. They don't even have there's too many layers that you gotta peel back. So right. I need I just need this to be talked about a little bit more so we yeah. have a deeper understanding of all that stuff. Yeah. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to yeah. engage with it because way back when I did that uh black boyhood video. And I made the comment about black parents moving to the suburbs being problematic. It didn't come across the way I wanted. And I had a lot of people who had that flying and make experience let me know that it didn't, they, they didn't appreciate how that came off. And I've constantly wanted to revisit, and I have revisited a couple of times because there is a space between, you know, being in solidarity with other black people but also having an experience that makes that solidarity difficult. But before yeah. I go any further, I want to make my man in the middle uh, speak on it. Yeah, go for it. Oh, I can't hear you, man. Still got Say something now. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Let me try plug it in my microphone again real quick in case since I can hear I think I might have had you muted still. Uh okay. All right, can you guys still hear me? Yeah, I can hear Are you. Are you echoing? Oh, I'm gonna. All right, I'm gonna just take the microphone out then. Yeah, and and sadly, I gotta rush you because I gotta. One, I gotta let Bellamy go. I don't know if she knew she's gonna be here until two thirty. I didn't know I was gonna be here until two thirty. Yeah. Um, but go ahead. Uh, so, yeah, just a quick rundown about me. Uh, I grew up in Twin Cities, then had to uh, move up to Fargo and Moorhead because the OA crash. Uh, came back down years later and everything like that. Uh, atypical uh, autism, yeah. Um, so, which aspect do you did you want me to like talk well, about? Where do you want to go? Take it. Okay, cool. Um, so, here's my whole thing about the whole like um, situations like you're, you're echoing Bob again. I'm that. sorry. Oh my bad. Um, you're not echoing anymore, all of a sudden. 
Oh, okay. No, um, it, it's kind of like in my email where the thing that like separated that changed my direction, like Abba's direction, stuff like this was uh, humility, uh, something, and then circumstances. So that's the big thing here where it's like, yes, these things are institutional and how we even come to these various mindsets are institutional ultimately, but the person is still responsible and ultimately chooses to which degree they feed themselves into that. Am I making sense? Kind of. Uh, I'll, I'll um, expand on that. So essentially, here's the thing. Abba was hurt by what you said about how he was side on you. No one can tell me no different. You don't do what you did and not be hurt by it. But he had the choice because all throughout your interactions with him, it's just been a series of like holding your hand on me like, you know, you can talk to me whenever you can talk to me, whatever. But he didn't want to do that because ultimately uh, some of it is the Internet and how it's just no one wants to be looked up, made a fool of here. But he's just an arrogant person. Like I've had conversations with him before once, only once before, you know, he makes a video saying I'm a liar or whatever. But uh, he's just not someone who's into being corrected if he's 100 percent certain he's right about something. And to like uh, piggyback off King Effect's whole thing, like I had a passing interest in him, and that's only because I started to like watch his videos once he started to get into his whole like trans arc, and it's just like, nah, this this ain't it, <laughs> this ain't it. So then I had to leave. But um, as far as I know, I'm hopping around just trying to get everything out before you got to go. But as far as the whole um, Destiny thing, this is this is the main thing. I've been watching Destiny, or I had been watching Destiny since I was like 15. And then kind of like you mentioned earlier, I had to slowly back away from it because just like this is getting real, real racist. It is getting real, real harder to ignore this. The thing that like really like did it was when... Uh, Back when all the protests was going on and everything, I, I was <laughs> I was I was one of the people there. The Twin Cities was yeah, yeah, in going Minnesota. Up. And then I so then uh, low B to me, I go to watch the uh, of Destiny stream just to like you know like calm down and everything because I'm still just smooth pissed off about everything that's happening right now. And then all I see is like the writing needs to stop. You, if they mow down you people, then it's whatever. And I'm like, my nigga. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. the thing about Destiny is he's an unfinished prototype where his whole thing is like, it's a cognitive dissonance, basically. It's, it's like this whole thing where it's like, jokes are just jokes. Uh, if I say the N-word in my own uh, home and no one hears it, does it really make a sound? Shit like that. But in that same vein, uh, wealthy, famous YouTuber FD Signifier, you can't say that Abba's being a coon because that's racism. Right. Not me saying nigga, but you uh, just being cautious of somebody. Yeah. yeah it's um, And we're going to have to uh, shut it here. I appreciate both y'all's input. Yeah, and I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna actually switch it up and get some last words. So real, real quick. Test, test, test. And I'm gonna close this. Bellamy, I'm letting, I'm shutting it down. I saw from screen bar, so I can let you go. Test, test. Why can't I? Oh, I can't hear myself. I'm sitting there thinking, why can't I hear myself? I'm not supposed to be able to hear myself. I, I just got used to it. Oh, shit. Um, yeah, man. 
the 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 shit the the shit was wild. The shit is wild. I don't want to spend. I'm actually thinking differently. I don't want to add any more to you know Destiny and, and Abba's situation. Um, I just want to focus on the one useful con- conversation that came out of it, which is black people talking with other black people about the experiences of anti-blackness. And while I don't, I don't think I've, I don't think I have anything I want to take back that I've said about ABBA, um, uh, Shark, if and when you, you hear this, you can hit me up on Discord and we can have a private conversation. And if it's really important for you to, to have it be content, we can have a public conversation. Um, uh, but there is a very underdeveloped conversation around internalized anti-blackness. It's kind of like things I've talked about before in terms of like the carcerality of our like nature, especially here in the States. We know how to punish people. We can very easily point out coon behavior and uncle Tom behavior. Um, but we don't have a good framework for pulling black folks in. I have a lot of empathy for the couple of brothers that watch Destiny or Shark and are feeling away. Like I can imagine, I can imagine right now being like a leftist content consumer and seeing the emergence of all these black content creators and then feeling like you can't be a part of that because you may not be accepted, right? I, I don't envy that. And I don't want people to feel like that. I don't want people like, I'm not gonna, like create the biggest click ever and say everybody or whatever, but I don't want people to feel like their contribution to this content or this space or just black experiences in general is invalid and cannot be connected because the version of blackness that they are experiencing isn't frontline and that they're struggling with, with making connections with other black people. I don't want people to feel like that at the same time. I'm not going to abide by or defend black folks who do anti-black shit um, and think they're supposed to not be critiqued for it. You know, what I am saying is the middle space between those two extremes is underdeveloped. There's ways in which people perform anti-blackness that are greatly a product of things out of their control just like all of us. And they want earnestly to work on it. And it's not going to be an easy, seamless transition. So there have to be people prepared to, to, you know, make that transition possible. Um, And I think we don't have that. At the same time, you donate $10,000 to the police. I'm going to call you a coon. You jokingly donate $10,000 to the police. I'm going to call you a coon. Um, you behave as such. I'm going to call you as such. No, this is not racist. <laughs> I don't even want to continue even explaining how that's not racist. Um, this is like the same logic of like people saying turf is a slur. Turf is a slur. It's pick me racist. It's pick me misogynistic. When somebody calls another, when a woman calls another, when a woman calls another woman a pick me, should I be able to, should I as a man be able to go and police that woman's language and say, you're being misogynistic. No, it's fucking stupid. And I know better than to open my mouth and do that shit. Um, anyway, uh, that's all. That's all. I really appreciate everybody being here. I really appreciate um, the, the conversation, even the, the folks that, you know, had different perspectives. Uh, I hope people notice the difference between uh, having a, a discussion with disagreements um, versus uh, a debate, you know, is this count as me breaking my echo chamber? Probably not to the people that say it, but like no, nothing will. Um, appreciate everybody. If people call Karen a slur, like, all right, we'll, we'll come back to that. I will come back to that. I got to go. I love y'all. Thank you so much for being here. Peace and blessings. Shout out to Bellamy. Uh, flowers in the chat for Bellamy, who was up at 10 o'clock with me getting this figured out. This is way, like, this was low-key seamless, wasn't it? Yeah. This is me, Pat, Pat Bellamy, you know, Pat's on the back for Bellamy because, oh, yeah, you want to thank Bellamy? You can you can click that, uh, click up that Patreon. You know, support your girl. You know? 
So I'll let that linger for a second. Let that linger for a second. But yeah, yeah, people, people, certainly it's a slur, you know, under, under those circumstances. It is what it is. All right, y'all. Thank you so much. I got to get out of here. Peace and blessings. I'm going to head.